Hi everyone, today we're looking at Five Tribes The Jinns of Nakala, a game from designer Bruno Catala with a very strong Arabian Nights flavor. In this strategy game, up to four players will try to earn the trust of five different tribes to become the new Sultan of Nakala. Let me show you how it's played. Welcome to Nakala, a sultanate full of opportunities since the death of its ruler. Oracles say that a new sultan is about to be named, but only after he can earn the favor from the five tribes living in the desert. The viziers, the elders, the merchants, the builders, and the assassins. In practice, players will earn victory points during the game, and the player with the most points at the end of the game will be the new sultan. In five tribes, multiple paths lead to victory points. You'll get some points from the tribes themselves, from the tiles that form the board, from the gins you can recruit, from the merchandise you can buy at the markets, and even from the money still in your possession at the end of the game. The Sultanate of Nakala is made of 30 tiles randomly assembled to form a 6x5 grid. Three meeples are also randomly placed on each tile. By the way, meeple is a generic term used in board games and typically it designates a little pawn in the shape of a person. Here in five tribes, the meeples represent the different tribes you can find in Nakala, each with its own specific color. The viziers are in yellow, the elders are white, the builders are blue, the green meeples are merchants, and the reds are assassins. Next to the board, nine merchandise cards are placed face up and form the marketplace. Three Jinn cards are also revealed on the side. The Jinns are mighty allies that players can summon to get access to their special powers. A bid order track and a turn order track are positioned like this. The player markers are randomly placed on the bid order track, then each player gets 50 gold coins and 8 camels to the color of his choice. The game can now begin. The first thing to do is to determine the turn order. Following the order from the bid order track, everyone will decide how many coins he's willing to pay to secure his turn order. For instance, Pink decides to pay 3 gold coins, Blue pay 5 gold coins to play before Pink, Black doesn't want to pay, so does Orange who pushes Black at the end of the track. After this bidding phase, the new turn order is now Blue, Pink, Orange and Black. Let me remind you that at the start of the game everyone received 50 gold coins and that coins are converted into victory points at the end of the game. It is therefore important to find a good balance in between the desire to play first and the need to save up money. Now that the turn order is set, every player will play by following 5 steps. The first one of them is really simple and only consists on replacing one player's marker onto the bid order to prepare for the next turn. The second step is a bit more tricky and represents the meat of the game. It involves moving the tribes on the board to earn the right to use specific actions, gain victory points, and possibly get control of a tile to earn even more victory points. Let's review all of that very slowly by first explaining the rules to move the tribes around. To move some meeples, a player must first grab all the meeples from a tile, then scatter them one by one following certain rules. It is not legal to make a U-turn, it is not legal to move diagonally, and the last meeple placed must necessarily join another meeple from the same color on the last tile. The player then takes all the meeples of the tribe newly united. If other meeples from different colors are still on the tile, nothing happens, but if after taking the meeples the tile is completely empty, the player can claim ownership of the tile by placing one of his camels. This tile is now his, and at the end of the game, this player will earn as many victory points as written on it. Here, the player will receive 8 victory points. Know that other players can still travel across or even stop on this tile, but no one else can take its control and place a camel onto it. Now comes the tribe's action step. The color of the meeples the player just grabbed will indicate which action he can take. If the player ends his turn with a vizier, he needs to take all the yellow meeples from that tile and to place them in front of him. At the end of the game, every single vizier he has will give him one victory point. Ten bonus points are given for every player with less viziers than you do. Which means that blue would get 30 bonus points for having more viziers than pink, orange and black. Pink would get 20 bonus points for having more viziers than orange and black. Orange would get 10 bonus points for having more viziers than black. And black would get nothing more. The Elder action is similar to the Vizier action. The player grabs all the white meeples from the last tile and places them in front of him. At the end of the game, each Elder is worth 2 points. No bonus here to get more Elders than the other players, but the Elders can help to summon Jinns, like we'll see a little bit later. 
The player who uses the merchant action trades all the green meeples he got for cards from the market. The exchange rate is one card per meeple and the cards are always taken from the beginning of the line. Two types of cards can be found at the marketplace, merchandise and fakirs. Nine different types of merchandise are up for sale. The main goal is to gather as many different types of merchandise as possible in order to sell them back at the highest price possible. A pack of four different types of merchandise can be sold at 13 gold coins, while the complete collection of nine goods will get you 60 gold coins. As for the fakirs, they don't have any value in coins, but they can be very helpful, like we will see a little bit later. The builder action requires that you count how many blue tiles surround the tile you end on. This last one has to be counted if it is blue as well. Then you'll have to multiply this number by the number of blue meeples you'll take off the tile. That will indicate how many gold coins the player earns for that action. Here, the player gets 3 times 4, so 12 gold coins from the bank. The Fakirs can help the builders. Every Fakir card discarded can be considered as an extra builder, which gives more money when you multiply everything. Finally, the last tribe is the Dangerous Assassin tribe, capable of killing other meeples on the board. The number of red meeples grabbed indicates how far an assassin can strike. For instance, with three assassins, a player can kill one other meeple up to three tiles away. Here again, the fakirs can help since every fakir discarded increase the distance an assassin can strike by one tile. If killing a meeple empties a tile, the player can immediately place one of his camels on the tile to control it. Know that an assassin can also kill a vizier or an elder, which may be in the possession of any other players. After the move, the tile control check and the tribe's action phases, one more step needs to be done, which is to take the action linked to the tile itself. There are different types of tile in Nakala, oasis, villages, markets, and sacred places. If the player ends his turn on an oasis, he must plant a new palm tree on this tile. At the end of the game, the player who controls this tile will earn 3 points per palm tree. Villages work the same way, but this time the player must place a palace on the tile, and each palace on the tile is worth 5 points. Next come the small and the large markets. According to its size, a player can decide to pay 3 gold coins to take one of the first 3 goods in the marketplace, or to pay 6 gold coins to take 2 of the first 6 goods. Lastly, the sacred places are where players can invoke a djinn. A player will have to discard 2 elders or 1 elder and 1 fakir to summon a djinn, which he'll choose amongst the 3 revealed djinns next to the board. The game offers a total of 22 different djinns. Each one of them grants victory points to the player who owns it, but also a special power. One will increase the value of the palm trees, another one the value of the palaces, one will protect its owner against the assassin, and yet another one will allow the player to place a camel on an empty tile, and so on. The djinn cards and the marketplace will only be replenished at the end of the round after all players have taken their turn. So let's sum up. A complete round of 5 tribes starts by bidding for turn order. After that, each player will put back his player marker on the bid order track, move some meeples, check if the destination tile can be controlled, take the tribe action, and finish the turn with the tile action. At any time during a turn, a player can also decide to sell some merchandise to earn extra money. When everyone has played, the marketplace and the gin cards are replenished, and we go back to the bidding part to determine the next turn order. The game keeps on going until a player places her 8th slash last camel, or until no more Lego moves are available on the board. It is then time to count the final score. Thankfully, 5 tribes comes with a scoring pad to add up all the different points a player can get during the game. Add up the coins you still have in your possession at the end of the game, Note how many points you have for the viziers, the elders, the jinns, the palm trees and the palaces on controlled tiles, the controlled tiles themselves, and even the merchandise that you can still sell at that point to grab extra money. The player with the most points wins the game and becomes the new sultan of Nakala. And here you have it, you now know how to play 5 tribes, so have fun and I'll see you in another episode with another board game on the table. Take care.